So uh, thanks everyone again for coming um, to today's uh, event um, with the Midlands Network of Popular Culture. Uh, my name is Georgie Williams um, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's event, uh, which is focused on historical theatre and performance cultures. Um, I'm a PhD researcher in the Department of Drama and Theatre Arts at the University of Birmingham, um, and I'm doing research into contemporary political theatre and the Gothic. Um, and I'm also on the organising committee for the MNPC. Um, and I'm joined today by Jade Martin, um, who is also on the committee, who's going to be moderating the event. Um, Jade, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jade Martin. I'm doing a PhD at the University of Birmingham in literature and science, uh, more specifically uh, genetics and science fiction. Thank you, George. Thanks, Jade. Um, so uh, I'm going to get straight into, into the event um, and I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Um, so first we have Dr. Anna Blackwell, um, who is a senior lecturer working in the Centre for Adaptations at De Montfort University. Um, Anna has published widely on the topic of contemporary of the contemporary Shakespearean actor and popular cultural adaptations of Shakespeare. And her first monograph on the subject, Shakespearean Celebrity in the Digital Age, Fan Cultures and Remediations, was published in 2018. Um, and then after um, Anna's presentation, we'll be hearing from Dr. Caroline Radcliffe, um, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Drama Theatre Arts at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Caroline has had a long freelance career in music and drama and is still an active performer in both fields. And her research is um, especially interested in 19th century theatre, popular theatre studies, technology and performance, and various areas related to music and drama. Um, so um, to begin, um, if I could ask um, everyone, um, uh, apart from Caroline and Anna, to turn off their cameras, um, just so we can uh, begin the first uh, initial session. Um, yeah, so, so I'm just changing to gallery view. Uh, so um, welcome both, thanks for joining us today. Um, I was just wondering, uh, just to um, start us off, if, uh, if you could talk a bit more about um, your research, um, what you're working on at the moment uh, and how, how that relates to what you'll be presenting today. Um, Anna, do you want to go first and then we can hear from Caroline? Sure, thank you Georgie. Um, I feel like a bit of an interloper into a session on theatre performance history because I'm very much interested in the contemporary. Um, I'm an adaptation scholar by trade so I'm not a theatre historian um, or really an early modernist, though I do work on Shakespeare. Um, but I'm particularly interested in the kind of micro instances of adaptation when it comes to Shakespeare, because he's such a ubiquitous presence in contemporary culture in particular, that very often you have these moments when he's being invoked or adapted in some way, and we don't even really pay attention to it. Um, so I started all of this with my PhD looking at Shakespearean actors because these are individuals who are perceived to have some kind of Shakespearean quality, but that's never defined, even though it's a large part of their star persona. And in fact, it's what they you know, make their careers on. Um, so that's where I started out, but I've moved more recently into more material forms of adaptation. So I'm really fascinated by the idea that there's this burgeoning market for craft, in particular, adaptations of Shakespeare's works. And I'm sure some of you have some kind of trinket or mug with Shakespeare's quotes on, and that's all part of it. Um, this very ubiquitous um, engagement with Shakespeare in ways which are nonetheless kind of um, actually tackling his legacy and what we think of Shakespeare. And even if that thing that we think about Shakespeare isn't necessarily part of his plays, um, just that apprehension is what I'm really fascinated by. Um, so what I'm talking about today is actually my next big project. So hopefully this will eventually be um, my next monograph. Um, and I'm using Shakespeare as my kind of gateway into looking at other material forms of adaptation. So eventually, hopefully, I'll also be able to talk about the way in which other writers have been adapted into craft um, adaptations so that I can start using these material forms to think about their power in kind of canon formation. Thank you, Anna, that's, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm making notes for the Q&A later. I think there'll be lots to talk about, so thank you. 
Um, Anna, uh, Caroline, uh, do you want to um, do the same? Give us uh, an introduction to your to your work. So at the moment, I'm actually working on the dramas of Wilkie Collins, which is a completely different uh, area of my research. Um, although it it does sort of coincide with popular performance studies because of course he was one of the biggest sensation novel writers um, so um, the thing that I'm talking about today clog dancing seems to keep keep catching up with me and it seems to have a huge afterlife that just um, keeps reinventing itself um, so I recently submitted my practical piece, The Machinery, which I made in conjunction with Sarah Anglis and John Harrison um, as a ref impact case study. Um, and uh, it started off as um, a chapter in my PhD, which was on the comedian Dan Lino. Um, he was a music hall and pantomime performance, and I'll talk about him in my presentation. Um, but it led me on to an area of popular culture, which I think has really addressed some of the main arguments that, that keep recurring about authenticity and a kind of, um, you know, whether there's an authentic spirit to working class culture. Um, and it's an area that that I'm, you know, I'm I'm still finding new leads to and, and new areas that I'd love to explore. Thank you, Caroline. Um, again, that was that was really interesting. Um, and I think you've both kind of touched upon this in terms of where your work. Um, intersects with uh, popular cultures, um, both how they develop um, naturally in certain environments and also popular culture studies um, as an academic discipline. Um, would you maybe be able to, uh, to talk about that in more, um, in more detail? Um, I was interested in what you were just saying, Caroline, about um, uh, working class cultures. Um, and that this is maybe something that you will talk about more in your presentation anyway. Um, but how, uh, how your how you're looking at um, popular culture sort of as something that develops um, in response to certain environments um, and also as a discipline. Um, and then after Caroline, Anna, if you could uh, respond to the same. Um, well, I think one of the main things about popular culture or certainly popular performance is that in order for it to be popular, it needs to transform and reinvent itself. And um, and also the the kind of ephemerality of of actually um, you know looking at culture that's rarely documented um, because I am a theatre historian I'm looking at something that took place um, you know well over a hundred years ago so there's there's very little practically no video and no you know no film no audio nothing um, so it's a matter of kind of recreating all those those very small clues and putting them together and um, and I think that um, lends itself to a natural kind of interdisciplinarity um, you, you can't just look at it from one point of view you have to look at it from a whole um, historical, sociological, political, cultural context in order to kind of piece, piece the archive together. Um, but I think also, you know, the other thing that I've really found through this research is I was really resistant at the beginning to attribute this um, indefinable kind of spirit of the people that people are always looking for when when they when they try and identify things like folk traditions or um, you know cultural traditions that they're, they're always saying well is it authentic is it is it um, something that you know arises from a particular class or a particular culture and I, I think you know in what I'm going to talk about I think I think we can pretty safely say that yes this did come out of um, a, a particular very 
working class, but also very global culture, which is the area which I haven't looked at enough yet. But I want to throw out a few kind of tempting ideas about that, um, because I think as we become more aware of movements like Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, political global movements and environmental movements, we, we need to sort of widen our research out of this, you know, very particular um, class and national identity that we tend to focus on with popular culture. Mm. Yeah, I, de I definitely agree. Um, Anna, do you want to jump in um, on that? Um, as well, I was I was thinking when you mentioned about the how it's necessarily for the things to to adapt and evolve um, for them to become a kind of popular culture. That sounds like something that's kind of connected to what you're talking about, Anna. Absolutely. Um, I suppose listening to what Caroline's saying there in terms of the popular as a reflection potentially of the working class, I think you see a really interesting thing with craft items where the ubiquity of Shakespeare there should seem to gesture towards something that is in its own way popular. Um, and yet Susan Luckman does some really interesting writing on the kind of purchasing behaviors you see on websites like Etsy or not on the high street, where actually she's saying we see a very particularly classed type of purchasing behavior where the purchasing of craft items is associated with other kind of um, ways of very selectively shopping, such as buying organic or upcycling, which are very often kind of limited or kind of restricted to the middle classes. Um, so I suppose it's interesting for me trying to explore this tension, um, particularly given my previous work on Shakespeare, particularly through Shakespeare and Shakespearean actors. I actually saw there a much more reciprocal relationship between the popular, the mainstream and Shakespeare. Because what you see through figures like Tom Hiddleston, Ian McKellen, Kenneth Branagh, is this really constant movement between representatives of highbrow culture, traditionally kind of um, traditional cultural capital, and more mainstream sites such as Hollywood blockbusters, for instance. And this is a wholly reciprocal relationship because um, while the blockbusters might trade on those performers' um, cultural capital in order to say something about their characters, um, high, high culture would in turn then, of course, borrow that because it gives them kind of mainstream availability and accessibility. Um, so I guess it, it's a mixed bag, but it, I do really enjoy exploring those moments where Shakespeare gets kind of incorporated into popular culture and times when that's kind of fully allowed, but other times when it happens and we still see a little bit of that gatekeeping tendency. Mm. That's that's really interesting. Um, that, that that does kind of intersect a bit with my research um, in terms of where the Gothic relates to high culture and low culture, mm. or what that is said to be at certain times. Um, I was wondering, do you, um, do you come across that a lot in your um, research, Caroline, into 19th century? Yeah, I mean, what, what I need to qualify is that when I'm talking about the working classes, mm -hmm. that's very much in terms of 19th century industrial working classes. So I wouldn't apply the same kind of class structure um, by any means if I was talking about popular culture today. And also, I think there's so much slippage between what popular culture is and, you know, you've got various, you know, many of the um, theorists from the Centre for Cultural Studies, um, people like Stuart Hall, you know, trying to define what those types of popular culture are, or Morag Shiak um, is, is really successful in kinds of saying, are we talking about people or are we talking about class or, you know, what, what, what constitutes popular? So for the purposes of my talk today, I'm talking very much about a kind of triadic Victorian class structure, which, you know, I think is no longer applicable to today's popular cultures. Mm. That, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, thank thank you for um, for, for clarifying that. Um, it's it's got me thinking um, about you mentioned earlier um, the ways that we have to sort of widen um, the scopes that we're looking at um, in the world at, at present when we have um, global movements. Um, 
And I was thinking, um, just to sort of close this first session, um, I, ma I mentioned the idea about um, certain cultures developing in, in response to certain environments. Um, and one of the things I kind of want to highlight um, as we're focusing on um, theatre performance cultures in this session is um, how, how that's changed in, in the world at present, um, considering that a lot of what we often think about theatre performance cultures is how that relates to communality and, and liveness and interactions with people. Um, whereas at the moment we're having to find different ways of establishing those communities or finding them, um, be it through online media um, or in other ways. Um, so how is that, how are those kinds of relationships um, reflected in your research? And also how has your research been uh, influenced or affected by um, everything? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure whoever wants well, to. Shall, shall yeah. I answer that and then Anna can come in? Um, uh, my work, The Machinery, which is, is the um, immersive film, has turned into some horrible kind of reflection of the COVID pandemic. <laughs> and we had a year's tour booked of, of various uh, kind of sites around Birmingham and the Midlands, um, which of course all got cancelled, uh, you know, due, due to all the restrictions. Um, when, when we filmed it originally, we did it as repeated screenshots. And now when you look at it, it looks horribly like a Zoom tutorial. Um, and it comments on, it opens with John Stuart Mill's quote about whether machines have ever lightened the toil of a human being. And I'm sure anybody in higher education probably feels at the moment that machines haven't, in fact, lightened the toil of any human being. They've kind of tripled it in terms of, you know, what we're having to put online and what we're doing face to face. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether I'm being a Luddite saying that, um, but, you know, at the same time, I really like my Hoover and my washing machine. But, um, you know, from, from the point of view of looking at the work now, it again has transformed itself into something that reflects the current political and and kind of um, you, you know the situation with the pandemic and and this is what I mean about popular things reinventing themselves is is if they're rooted in something that is so intrinsically political, I think they open themselves to being constantly reinterpreted. So we made the work originally in 2007 and we're still being booked to, to take it around places kind of like 13 years later, which we just never expected. That's uh, well, well done for that, first of all. Um, yeah, I, I saw, um, I think I saw something that you posted about um, it having to be postponed, which is, uh, which is really um, unfortunate, but hopefully it will obviously come to us all before long. Um, and Anna, do you want to just um, respond to that uh, question as well? Um, I suppose I, I do and I don't because I think my paper actually talks about this a little bit so I don't want to give it away right now. <laughs> yeah that's that's fine um, uh, we're, we're coming um, just to the end of uh, that session anyway so uh, maybe that's a good place for us to round this up. Um, thank you for uh, your discussions that's been really interesting. Um, I'm now very fueled up for the Q&A session at the end um, so um, I guess we can start off um, with your paper then, um, Anna. Um, so if, um, Caroline, if, if we can turn our cameras off and then um, if you want to start screen sharing, um, Anna. Uh, yeah, and away you go. Yeah, okay. Just shout if you can't hear me or anything like that. <clears throat> so. The coronavirus pandemic has inspired a number of already parodied cultural phenomena, as many of us have perhaps for the first time made our homes our main sites of leisure and work. On social media platforms such as TikTok or Instagram, the lockdown inspired the revival of an already popular internet aesthetic called cottagecore. Cottagecore is performed by internet users through posting pictures, videos, or other forms of digital content that is grouped under the same metadata tags online. 
Favourite cottagecore content, as you may be able to see, includes retreats into the countryside for walks, gardening, interacting with nature, but also lo-fi pursuits like baking, sewing and crafting. Given the enforcement of quarantine and social distancing across the world in the last year, such pursuits have obvious attraction, as they imagine an abundance free of panic buying or pressurised supply lines, as well as a freedom of movement that has been for many simply impossible. But unlike the arts and craft movements with which it shares many qualities, chiefly its desire for escape from urban centres, cottagecore is rooted in acts of fantasy. The increasing sophistication of personal technology and the ingenuity of content creators means that you can lead your best cottagecore life anywhere, whether swishing through a meadow in the deepest rural island or baking bread in Birmingham. And yet cottagecore isn't necessarily detached from reality. Sarah Woolley writes that for many millennials and Generation Zers, cottagecore lies under the shadow of climate grief. Indeed, one of the central appeals of cottagecore is that Rowan Ellis explains, its acts of fantasy are primarily a form of self-care, but that this doesn't entail a retreat from activism. Ellis continues that cottagecore can offer the LGBTQ plus community, in particular, a retreat that doesn't feel like banishment, but a specifically curated paradise. It can be a creative exercise in imagining a world free from heteronormativity and reframing femininity outside of its supposed inferiority to masculinity. Shania O'Brien, meanwhile, posits that cottagecore, that while cottagecore's potential as an aesthetic will always be limited, its values can be incorporated into one's own environmental, disability rights, feminist or anti-racist praxis. This explication of cottagecore doesn't convince everyone though. Adam Arola notes appropriately that the cottagecore impulse in Americans is inseparable from the colonial impulse that is ideologically infused into every fiber of American culture. Continuing rather less generously, Arola observes that it is hilarious and very sad that a certain segment of the internet left has actively embraced the aestheticization of politics. Denouncing Willie's claim that cottagecore has largely avoided ecofascism, or indeed other reactionary politics, Arola scoffs, of course the right will come to take your cottagecore away. It was always theirs to begin with. Now, the issue Arola presents is one shared, if inexactly, by craft versions of Shakespeare's plays, characters and legacies. Indeed, craft itself, a fundamental part of signaling cottagecore online, shares with the internet aesthetic, a complex and often appropriative relationship to femininity and heritage that is founded on the subversion of tradition. This is even more applicable in the case of Shakespeare craft, which is the focus of the remainder of my paper. But first, what do I mean by craft? Well, you can see here some examples of what probably springs to mind. A key part of craft's definition is its handmade quality. Macrame, knitting, embroidery, beading, these are all pursuits which could be done on industrial scale, but here they are produced by the individual's manual labor, either as a hobby or even as a money-making activity. There are particular cultural discourses surrounding those who pursue craft, however. Marty Grace and Enza Gandalf write of the perception of craft as something done by older women, nanas and craft freaks, whose homes are covered in patchwork and cross-stitch. These more traditional associations spring in part because craft typically refers to a range of practices known as the domestic arts. The prefixing of these artistic practices as domestic implies a functional and importantly self-taught or amateur quality that distinguishes it from pure fine art forms. In this way, the attribution demonstrates the continued denigration of art forms that have historically been pursued by women, even when they've been used outside of the designated home space. Now, of course, craft exceeds narrow classification and stereotypes about those who practice it, existing not only in mainstream forms, but activist or craftivist versions, such as groups like Anarchist Knitting Circle. And these groups are only the most recent examples of a long feminist tradition of subverting the very associations of craft 
to forge statements of solidarity, creativity, and power. So the items which I want to discuss for the rest of today can then be called Shakespeare crafts, or as Sudhita Iyengar calls them, Shakescrafts, because while they may not always originate from the same specifically handcrafted practices described already, the labor of the crafter is nevertheless visible. It's apparent not only in the potential uniqueness of the item, but its distribution by an individual rather than a factory line. In particular, I want to address the Shakescraft on sale on Etsy. Etsy is often a watchword in popular culture for overpriced junk. And with 2 million odd users, it stands to reason that at least a little bit of it is. But it's interesting regardless, because it offers a platform for independent craftspeople to sell their wares and break beyond the limitations of bricks and mortar retail, something which has, of course, proved particularly invaluable this year. Now, where craft reveals perhaps not only its similarity to cottagecore, but the reason for its fundamental place within the aesthetic is that despite its propagation via digital platforms, in a society swamped with mass manufactured goods, the handmade offers a reprise, an alternative, and an access to a world where technology takes the form of simple tools and objects are understood as safe and nostalgic. Cottagecore's desire for retreat, even if only experienced rather ironically through social media, is thus shared by the makers and consumers of craft, for whom its value lies in its alternative to anonymous mass-produced goods. So this crucial point is underlined in the case of the lively market for Shakescraft, which upcycle Shakespeare in order both to evoke what it offers as a text and performance, and to rediscover the pre-industrial processes and crafts of the imagined Shakespearean world. Shakescraft are valuable in of themselves as artifacts of a small scale and often highly individual adaptive process, but they also demonstrate particularly effectively as Julie Maxwell and Kate Rumbled write, that quotation has a constructive as well as a reflective relationship to Shakespeare's preeminence. What were previously understood to be one directional relationships are more accurately seen as two-way, even multi-way exchanges. Indeed, instances of creative quotations such as this or these speak to more than his ubiquity or his revered status in Western culture. They demonstrate the continually evolving nature of Shakespeare's legacy. There is, it seems, a quotation for quite literally every occasion, even a pandemic. What is more, Shakescraft offers a particularly visible opportunity to explore the continuing ways in which Shakespearean capital is forged along not only gendered but race lines. E-commerce sites like Etsy peddle a potent fantasy for its predominantly female population of makers. They offer what Sarah Mosel calls a promise that you can have a family and create hip arts and crafts from home during flexible, reasonable hours while still having a respectable, fulfilling and remunerative career. But this allure has been roundly critiqued by Angela McRobbie, who points out that the passionate attachment to something called my own work can be used as both status justification and disciplinary mechanism for staying within a precarious and often self-exploiting uh, creative sector. So the digital marketization of craft on sites like Etsy thereby offers what Nicole Dawkins describes as a vantage point by which to see the parallels between late stage capitalism and post-feminism. On the one hand is Etsy's promotion of precarious self-employed gig labor as a preferable alternative to more stable forms of employment. And on the other is its result, what Diane Negra calls a proudly backward return to a domestic, return to the domestic, to largely low paid labor. This is a retreat which is affected through a grammar of individualism that elides the specifically gendered, raced and bodied ways in which precarity works on the subjects of neoliberalism in favor of praising the moral character of the often white individuals who practice their apparent choice. <laughs> 
Shake's graft is not only a vantage point for these intersections by virtue of being part of the digital craft marketplace, however. The objects on sale themselves often represent the same simultaneous recognition of gender inequality and denial of the socio-economic and cultural structures that shape our lives. Or in an illustration of the coalescing of capitalist and post-feminist ideals, an attitude that Catherine Rottenberg calls neoliberal feminism. This is, uh, sorry, I'm being heckled now, a flawed gesture towards female empowerment in popular media and culture, which sutures feminist with anti-feminist. Sorry, I failed there. I tried to shut a dog out and I've just succeeded in trapping two in with me now. One second. Um, so neoliberal feminism is a flawed gesture towards female empowerment in popular media and culture, which sutures feminist with anti-feminist and conservative ideas of gender. Now, the naughtiness of this phenomenon is illustrated by one particular example of Shakespeare that reads Ophelia as both of her time and as someone troubled by issues that remain relevant to contemporary women. Now, this quick section of my talk comes with a quite mild content warning for some references to suicide and to self-harm. So if that's upsetting or triggering, I'd recommend just muting me for a couple of minutes and you'll see when this section of the talk has ended, when the purple slide flashes up again. So this is the Iphelia Ophelia embroidery pattern available as a PDF download on Etsy. Its creator has thoughtfully designed a wreath of flowers that encircle the text in the middle of the pattern, including, of course, the flowers that Ophelia mentions in her final onstage appearance, rosemary, pansies, fennel, columbine, and rue. The creator continues in her description that Ophelia's great bravery lies in being a woman of intelligence in a time before female autonomy. They note that in choosing to end her own life, Ophelia rejects being mansplained to, ignored and committed. She gains control of her life. The statement of solidarity at the heart of the pattern, Ophelia, is then an expression of understanding and compassion for those women who are the only sane ones in the room, even if they're told they're crazy. This is a perhaps well-intentioned, but nonetheless troubling um, sentiment because of its ideation of suicide as a means of control. The design is thereby emblematic of a post-feminist use of craft to create empowering feminist statements for women, but in a way that doesn't recognize the structures that make empowerment necessary and perhaps even futile. Kirsty Robertson suggests that it is precisely the apparent novelty of craft which grants it efficacy through a reversal of stereotype rather than more politically engaged links to previous feminist thought or action. And Ophelia is indeed a particularly problematic vessel for this kind of feminist work, because even if, as Craig Green posits, quotations gain new meaning in the very act of quotation, such micro instances of adaptation in Shakespeare are still connected to the context of their meaning. And some characters and situations prove more intractable than others. Ophelia is perhaps more distinctly located in relation to her death in Hamlet because she has a formidable cultural afterlife, which as Stephen Neal writes, rivals that of Hamlet himself. Gertrude's vivid account of the mermaid-like Ophelia sinking to her death, seemingly inured to her own suffering, has indeed begot a rich and troubling history of representation and appropriation. Ophelia has become, Remedios Perny writes, an icon of psychological distress. The images on screen include, of course, John Millet's famous portrait of Ophelia modelled by Elizabeth Siddle, but also some of the many examples collected by Erica Bianca Romero of Vogue shoots, which are so clearly based on Ophelia. Their glamorization of the Ophelia body in turn fuels less public and even more worrying instances of fetishization. Commenting on the popularity of Ophelia among pro-anorexia and pro-bulimia online communities, Perny observes that this Ophelia is not so much a symbol of social criticism as an apology for suffering. She is the embodiment of a martyr who longs for everything but her own recovery. 
Pani continues that by embedding Ophelia in their imaginary worlds, she's used to help justify and encourage their self-destructive drives at the same time that they become cultural producers of her character. This means that even if users on communities such as these hold out on the possibility of empathy and communion, a language of perfection pervades through the continual association of Ophelia with a form of thin, white, beautiful, controlled femininity. So the Ophelia design is quite a distinctive example of the issues with utilizing not only craft, but Shakespearean characters and texts in order to make feminist statements of solidarity or sympathy, but other complications can be seen in Shakespeare. Helena's description of her friend Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream, though she be but little, she is fierce, is the most obvious and frequently used example of marketizing feminism through Shakespeare. Indeed, you can see in the top left-hand corner, a baby grow, which is sold by the Royal Shakespeare Company from a line that they've held in stock for a number of years now. Now on the surface, this is an empowering statement, a reminder of female strength despite potential comparative physical weakness. And this reading only gains currency in light of the accelerated appropriation of gay and drag culture by the mainstream. Fierce in this context also means exceptional, unapologetic, confident or bold, not purely the violent capability of the word's original definition. It's even a somewhat appropriate selection for Shakespeare, given the play itself details the friendship between the two women and the loving image of them sewing together. Its dramatic context is of course though vastly different. Helena delivers the line as one of many insults against her friend, who she thinks has betrayed her. Moreover, while Shakespeare's plays include a number of references to female craft, its expressive value is often minimized in favor of its larger function as a metaphor for an interior life that is rarely glimpsed. For instance, the seemingly cruel reminder in Titus Andronicus that Lavinia is not allowed even Philomela's recourse to dramatize her assault in embroidery. Or in the case of a fellow's mother's handkerchief, the ability of handcrafts to become vehicles for violent and misogynistic interpretation. So Kirsty Robertson questions whether the political effectiveness of craft in fact relies inherently on the gendering of textile work. And if the use of knitting, embroidery and quilting for political ends requires their subjugation in others. After all, the pleasure of samplers like Though She Be But Little She Is Fierce, or even more explicitly feminist handcrafts, lies in their simultaneous acknowledgement of embroidery conventions and their refusal to perform the type of femininity expected to embroider. Now, Robertson's question is hard to answer. But what is clear nevertheless is that these craft statements, for all their subversive delight, mirror Alison Phipps' characterization of mainstream feminism as a feminism which wants power within the existing system rather than an end to the status quo. Mainstream feminism co-ops the work of women of color and in turn erases it. It also fails to acknowledge other intersecting forms of privilege such as class and sexuality. A telling example of this comes from the time of the women's protests against then President Donald Trump. Reflecting on the trend for pussy grabs back slogan t-shirts in the wake of Trump's claims to grab women by their genitals, Gabrielle Moss lamented that she couldn't buy a t-shirt with Alice Walker's mantra, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. This, Moss argued, would be a way of asserting feminist power without relying on the damaging words of a sexual predator. Now, pleasingly, the imagined Walker craft and others like it do exist online for sale, but tellingly, the listings are in the hundreds rather than the thousands, as they are for Shakespeare, or indeed for the wave of accessories and items emblazoned with the description of Senator Elizabeth Warren. Nevertheless, she persisted. That Warren's impressive indefatibility was first commented on because she attempted to read out the words of the black civil rights activist, Coretta Scott King, has since been forgotten. 
This, as complex as it may seem, is the immediate context for though she be but little she is fierce, and the other seemingly feminist Shakescraft items. A mainstream marketization of feminism that utilizes the depiction of white women via the words of a dead white male author to speak for the universal experience of all women. Cottagecore, sorry, Cottagecore and Shakescraft thus share an aspiration to engage with, recover and potentially appropriate a relationship with the past in order to ascribe new meaning or to open up to groups that have previously been excluded from it. Cottagecore invites a fantastical imagining of the natural landscape and related pursuits in a way that can both challenge and recognize the environmental and or colonial exploitation of the land. Online storefronts, meanwhile, remove overheads which might once have been prohibitive financially or psychologically, allowing the entry of new players into the symbolic and economic Shakespeare marketplace, decentering the production of Shakespearean meaning and the exchange of Shakespearean capital from traditional sites. These are both good things, but the admirable quality of these sentiments doesn't free either cottage core or Shakescraft from the myriad, perhaps inevitable complications that occur because they still operate within neoliberal systems that are structured to favor certain bodies and ideologies over others. Adam Marola's assessment that right-wing politics will come to take your cottage core away may feel cynical, but given the aesthetic's proximity to eco-fascist and white supremacist ideals, his concern is warranted. And as I hope I've started to show through my paper, there is a difficulty too in involving Shakespeare in the commodification of feminism, given market forces too will come to commodify these practices and simplify his play's complexity. This is an issue we're hopefully alert to, but Shakespeare requires or demands a renewed and particular attentiveness. Much of contemporary craft is marked by its whiteness Susan Luckman observes. It is, she continues, protected discursively on account of its links with wider, markedly middle-class and often white practices with an ethical or at least progressive sensibility, such as buying organic, with the consequence that its racial politics remain relatively uninterrogated or even acknowledged. Now, when this context for the craft items is then paired with their design, production, and any acts of quotation which are necessarily selective, there is a further danger of reinforcing the whiteness of much of the plays, its performance, and scholarly history. Shakespeare's characters are inherently, but invisibly, raced. Shakespeare is thus both uniquely vulnerable to and a particularly visible example of the way that Shakespeare meaning can shift in response to the waves and patterns of the neoliberal marketplace. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Anna. That was really interesting. Um, what I forgot to mention at the start was um, either we can use the um, the, the reactions to give an applause or at the end I'm going to ask everyone to turn off the microphones and give a, a sound applause. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, thank you Anna, that was really interesting. Um, and um, it's actually perfectly timed as well um, uh, for us to go straight into um, Caroline's talk. Um, Caroline, do you want to turn on your camera? Um, and uh, again, um, if you want to just uh, give uh, Jade a cue um, whenever you'd like to yeah. share um, any video um, or anything like that. Let me just try and share my PowerPoint. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's Hang on. Uh, sh I'm sharing my very busy screen. Is that okay? Um, it's... If you want to just um, uh, press escape and then go back into full screen, um, it's, it's oh. showing a kind of glitch for me. Um, Hang on, let's just make that big. Oh, don't know what's happening. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's fine now. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. I'm ready, you ready. Um, so I'm not reading a paper today. I'm just going to summarise a few of the areas that my research on 19th century clog dancing in the musical and also in the industrial factory. 
um, have have um, evolved in. Um, so if we take our starting point from the Industrial Revolution, and um, this was towards the end of the 18th century, clogs were already a form of um, working people's footwear. And the reason that they chose them were they, they were affordable, they were easily replaceable, um, they were waterproof, um, and, and so they were already associated with agricultural um, types of labour. But with the rise of these huge cities, and you can see Manchester in this, this one, um, they became associated with, with an urban population. And they became the sort of footwear that began to symbolise the um, the misery and the squalor of the working classes. Um, if you uh, look to something like North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, um, there's a scene in which um, one of the workers literally throws a clog at the manager of the factory and it becomes a kind of symbol of um, labour against capital. And this is something obviously that was taken up by Frederick Engels and Karl Marx and I'll talk about that later on in the talk. So along with the Industrial Revolution, um, the rise of the music hall happened. And with the Theatres Act in 1843, the music hall separated out from the legitimate theatre. And music hall, again, was something that was urban. It um, occurred in areas which had um, huge populations that um, it tended to be around areas of workplaces, things like factories or docks, um, places where emigration um, went backwards and forth. Um, so uh, in this slide, you'll see a very early musical. Um, and we can say that the rise really occurred around the 1850s. And this gives you an idea of a sort of music hall like somewhere like Wilton's or Hoxton Hall, which two of the oldest surviving music halls in Britain. Um, you can see that they're very informal. Um, people are just kind of wandering around, drinking and eating. Um, then they don't necessarily have all their attention on the stage. Um, and there's a lot of contact between the performer and the audience in the way that the stage is, is often thrust into the centre of the music hall. So this was the type of place that um, clog dancing, which had been part of the legitimate theatre, found its kind of true home, really. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, someone who who really um, developed that as, as a musical form of entertainment. So this is Dan Lino. And instead of the pantomime performer, who you might have heard of him as, and that's him on the left, um, performing as one of his famous cross-dressed um, pantomime characters at Drury Lane. Um, and that's him on the right as a champion clog dancer of the world. And you see him standing there, very much um, male with his moustache and his clog dancing championship belt, um, his very smart suit and um, his fob watch. And it's a very, very different persona to the one that we're used to, which is that of the comedian, the pantomime dame. Um, but in fact, the clog dancing was the thing that he was most proud of. And my thesis explored his whole career in terms of the hegemonic influences that really steered his career within the music hall and how the music hall as um, a real um, capitalist industry um, really took over and um, disallowed him from sticking to the skill that he was really most affiliated to that, that was clog dancing. <laughs> 
lots of people now associate clog dancing with folk dance. They may have seen Morris dancers doing clog dancing. They've got an idea of it as being quite humorous, something that's very simple, that's not taken very seriously. But at this time, it was really the street dance of the lower classes. So as I say, it developed from this kind of agricultural strand and it moved into urban areas and towns. And it became the equivalent, really, of street dance today, what we think of as, as things like break dance and hip hop. Um, and I'll show later on in this talk how we can still find parallels and how actually many of the steps that were established through these step dancing clog traditions uh, are still found in those dances. Um, and in fact, it seems to be younger people now who recognise steps within the dances that somebody like me might perform as being common to the sort of dances that they learn today. Um, they're passed on through a vernacular tradition. They're rarely written down. Um, it's been something that um, developed over the years through families and through families of performers. Um, it was a skill that uh, really prized originality. So part of the skill was to develop and to invent new steps. And it was extremely skilled. It was the forerunner of tap dance. And it was through, um, and again, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but it was through the roots of black dancing and through that kind of um, travel between America and Britain and the music halls um, that jazz dance um, developed out of clog step dancing and, and soft shoe dancing. Uh, now, if you look at this championship belt, um, one discovers more uh, connections to other areas of popular culture. And anybody who's familiar with boxing will realise that this is almost identical to the champion boxing belts that, that are still awarded today. Uh, this one's remarkable in that it's, it's solid silver, and so it was an extremely important belt. Um, it was associated with betting. Uh, it was a competition belt. Um, and, and it was really worth a lot of money. If you think that the average music hall performer was earning about two pounds a week, two to three pounds a week, um, this belt would be awarded along with something like 200 pounds um, from bets. Um, so it was big money for musical performers. It was also big money for musicals because uh, they would whisk up a huge amount of publicity in the sporting papers and in the stage papers, um, advertising the, the competition and, um, and raising the stakes. So it was very much associated with lower class forms of not only entertainment, but sport as well. And there are also associations with racing. And I'll talk about that, those when I come on to talking about women in clog dancing. Uh, if you look to the sides of this slide, you'll see the, the figure of the clog dancer. And you'll see that they had a set costume, which was a white linen shirt, um, short trousers so that you could see the legs um, and, and the wooden clogs, um, which became more and more developed um, for the performer rather than for working in industry. So this was the belt that Dan Lino won in his famous competition in the 1880s. Um, and uh, by looking at the... Um, the, the advertisements that Lino put in, in the sporting and the performance papers, we see that it was a really, really challenging form of entertainment. And again, the language is very similar to the sort of language that you find for things like boxing matches. 
Also, the format of the clog um, competition or clog battle um, was held in the same way as a boxing match. So often the, the performer uh, would start off with a song which boasted about their triumphs. Um, it basically dissed the other competitors. Um, it often brought up past contentious events um, and it roused the crowd. Um, the other thing that we discover is that this was a form of entertainment that attracted gangs. And again, this is something that we find later on, which has its kind of parallels in street dance and hip hop and later a form of dance called crit walking. Um, but there are accounts given by Lino, which indicates that, uh, for instance, when he was at the um, People's uh, music hall in Manchester, um, there was the presence of two of the main gangs in Manchester. Um, and they were gangs that were located in Ancoats, which was a really rough area of Manchester. Um, it was often, gangs were often associated with religious factions, so it might be Catholics versus Protestants. Uh, you find a similar pattern in towns like Glasgow and Liverpool. Um, and um, gangs would often disrupt these competitions either by um, literally lynching the performers as they were going in through the stage door or doing sort of nefarious tricks like throwing brick dust on the stage or throwing things at their head while they were dancing or just fighting within the music halls. Now, this research that um, I uncovered um, while researching Lino, um, really upset a lot of contemporary clog dancers um, because the idea of this rural sort of folksy tradition um, that tries to be very respectable and um, tries to be recognised. Um, for instance, it was given money by the National Lottery under, under the sort of sporting auspice, um, really didn't like this idea of it being um, such a working class and such contentious form of entertainment. Um, but, you know, it really um, accords with, with the type of parallels that you find in popular dance now, and particularly in street dance. So if we look at these competitions as being a kind of equivalent to, to the kinds of hip hop battles that go on, I think we get a closer idea of, of the, the type of investment that these performers had. Um, if, if you... One, I'm not going to share it now because it's a little bit complicated, but there's, there's a very, very early film of the Men's Clog Dancing Championship in the 1890s. And this was something that was established by one of the main music hall managers who, um, who had, in fact, been a clog dancing manager. So um, Dan Lino didn't take place uh, in this one, but he was one of the judges. And again, there were huge stakes. There was a lot of publicity. Um, and there's a very short film from um, 1898, which shows the main performers. The film isn't that impressive because it was, um, it's actually one of the earliest British films. And it was filmed um, under very restricted circumstances. It had to be very short. Um, but in it, you see John Burns, who was one of, he was the winner, and he does a little trick dance on a plate at the end. Now, unfortunately, the next competition that he went on to win, uh, he got very drunk, ran under a tram in Trongate in Glasgow and lost a leg. But that didn't stop him because clog dancers were resourceful. He went on to be a champion one-legged clog dancer, um, which many clog dancers did. So why don't we know about clog dancing? 
It was really absolutely the most popular form of lower class dance in the 19th century. Um, it was the kind of dance craze of the music halls. Um, and it was a, um, a transnational um, skill. It turns into, as I say, it turned into tap dance. Um, and yet it's kind of been uh, suppressed somehow. There's very little documentation. Um, as I said earlier, there's, there's uh, very few pictures. There's hardly, hardly anything left of it, except for the steps that have been transmitted over the years through families and through performers of clog dancing. So this is very typical of the kinds of criticism um, that was published in books like Arthur North's um, Variety Artists. Actually, this is from a newspaper clipping. Um, but if you look at a book like Percy Fitzgerald's Music Hall Land, um, they're all rather looking at it from a, a sort of high culture point of view. And they talk about the awful, painful, fearful expression of the faces of the artistes as they go through with it. Um, the exit is an embarrassed, awkward sidle off the stage. Well, this really can't be further from the truth, because when you look at the accounts of the champion clog dancers and the reviews in the industry's papers, such as the era, um, clog dancing was immensely popular and it was a staple um, element of the musical performance. It also made its way into the minstrel performance. So from the 1840s onwards, it was a staple of, of the, the classic minstrel act. Um, and then, uh, of course, it transferred to the musical stage through blackface performance. It then turned into kind of soft shoe shuffles, um, things like Lily of Laguna, and, and it then transformed into tap, as I said. But we find more and more of these um, accounts in the... Um, you know, what I would call the legitimate press about how awful clog dancing was and how um, nobody could possibly understand it. Um, as I said, it's got this similarity with street dance and hip hop battles. And one of the lines that I want to pursue, but certainly won't be until COVID's over, um, would be to go to America and to trace the real lineage between um, black dance that came from slave plantations um, that, that um, became clog dancing and that was taken into the musicals and then brought over to Britain and to actually try and trace some of these steps. Um, but we see, we still see this, this um, criticism of uh, this type of popular performance. So I just found this today, actually, and it was from the 2012 Olympics. Serena Williams, who, who had an amazing win, did a little celebratory crip dance. Now, crip dance is um, a step dance that was made famous by Los Angeles gangs in the 19. 90s and 1970s and as with most popular culture it kind of infiltrated into um, a more mainstream culture and it became integrated into things like hip-hop but if you look at this um, report from that lovely paper the Daily Mail um, it talks about how a Fox Sports reporter um, said that she was immature and classless. And I think it's this kind of um, insult about class that, that we see reiterated, you know, throughout the 19th century, and it's still levelled at something which is basically um, a popular form of performance. Um, so also we find that women were doing it. So unusually, 
um, because most of the accounts are about men. Uh, the ladies' clog dancing contest, which was created off the back of the men's clog dancing contest because it was so successful financially, um, gave us a bit of insight into the fact that, that loads of female performers were doing it as well. And um, my research in terms of, of the women um, reveals not only that it was um, uh, families from travelling, travelling families, um, also a lot of Irish um, immigrants who come over to work in the cotton mills in places like Liverpool, um, and um, also fa families of performers. And so um, this performer, um, Nellie Martel, issued a challenge. And again, we're talking about big money. Similar to something like Wimbledon, the women never quite achieved the same status. They, they instead of um, the same amount of money, they got slightly less money, they got fewer rewards, but they also had to dance fewer steps. But the interesting thing is that she issues the challenges in the same way as the men do. It's extremely combative. Um, it's, um, it's very insulting towards her fellow clog dancers. It drags up all sorts of histories about competitions that have already taken place. Um, and, and so it continues this, this tradition that's, that's similar to... Um, the, the sort of pugilistic um, tradition. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to, there we are. Um, and in fact, the woman who ran, Minnie Ray, was not a woman to be messed with at all. She comes across as, as a, very, um, a very challenging performer indeed. And in the way that Dan Lino boasted about her, uh, his performances, she, she also has this kind of um, narrative. So if you want to know more about Ladies' Clog Dancing Contest, I've written a chapter about it in this publication. Now, what it led me on to um, discover um, was that apart from the fact that women performed in the music halls, they performed clog dancing in, the, um, in their private sphere, but also in their work sphere. And this led to a piece called The Machinery, which was based on a dance um, which I learned from the clog dancer Pat Tracy, who died in 2008. And she was one of an un unbroken line of clog dancers, um, and she could trace the steps for this particular dance back to the 1820s directly through her family line. Um, they were handed down through um, mother and grandfather and uncles. Um, and in fact, they probably go back earlier. They probably go back to the end of the 18th century, the rise of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so the, the reason I've, I first started to create a performance out of it was a call of papers about repetition and it got me thinking about repetition and labour. And I knew that this dance was associated with labour because the steps imitate the, the components of the machines of the cotton mills. And it comes from a style of clog dancing that was called Lancashire Heel and Toe. And this was the particular style that Pat Tracy um, taught and, and was you know, what, well, the best performer um, of recent times. It was also the style that Dan Lino did. And in fact, some of the steps have been passed down as Dan Lino steps, and they're still taught today. Um, so going back to this image of, of the Industrial Revolution, we see this um, you know, rise of, of all of the factories and the cotton mills and um, the sort of capitalist uh, means of production that Marx was criticising. Um, so I went back to the source material. I went back to Marx's capital 
And in fact, um, what I didn't realise was that most of it is a history of the textile mills. And uh, uh, he gives very, very detailed accounts of, of the work that went on in the textile mills. Um, from the census reports, if we look at this, this is census report for a particular street in Blackburn, and we see that almost every single person in that road was working at the cotton mills, um, and that the women and the children are the ones who do the weaving work, they do the textile work, they're the ones on the machine floor, and often they're the ones earning the main living. Um, the men tend to do the heavier work, they do the sort of shifting and loading and getting cotton bales. So, so one of the things that I hadn't realised that it was the women and the children who were working the machinery, and that this was essentially um, developed by women working um, at these machines. So we went to Quarry Bank Mill and we recorded the sounds of the machines, me and Sarah Anglis, who's a composer and sound artist. Um, they've got lots of original textile machines. And what I also did was that I tested the steps out against the original machines. Um, let me just skip to the machinery. Um, so um, Pat had always claimed that the machines imitated the rhythms and that they imitated the movements. Um, and often there were kind of wooden boards um, next to, you, you can see some of them, um, they're next to the machines and they, they act almost as a kind of acoustic board. And what Pat had always said was that the women, while using their hands, danced at the machines. They just kind of rattled their feet um, because clog dancing, heel and toe, is something that's very much the feet and the, the um, legs only. So you could still be doing your work with your hands. Um, and if, if, I, if I wasn't on Zoom, I'd get up and I'd give you a bit of a demonstration, but I can't do that. Um, but we see um, that steps are called after components of machinery, things like the pick, um, which is basically the shuttle flying backwards and forwards, um, the cog, uh, which imitates the movements of the cogs interlocking, um, the, um, the very limited arm movements that, that Pat did have imitated these bobbins that fly backwards and forwards. And this is a step that we still see in all the um, hip hop and, and crip dances, which is the weaving or the herringbone. Um, and this really fundamental kind of step dance movement that imitates this kind of textile. Um, I'll just skip back to where I was. Okay, um, so this rather idealised picture shows, as I said, that it was the women who were working these machines. Um, and you can see they're all wearing clogs. Um, so, you know, this was real embodied practice. This was something that we kind of pieced together with the evidence that we had with the steps of the dance and, and what the information that I had from Karl Marx. Um, but one of the things that he claimed, which um, I wanted to really contest, was his idea of alienation and the idea that the, uh, the worker is completely subsumed by the work and by um, being overtaken by the machines. And I think what Sarah and I concluded is that this machine was this uh, machinery dance was actually an example of women's creativity and of how a, an art form, albeit a lower class art form, and uh, the kind of higher class commentators don't like to call it an art form, but this was something incredibly creative that, that grew out of the machines and became its own noise music and its own um, dance and choreography, was that this was a way of actually taking control of the machines themselves. And so rather than becoming automata, 
uh, as Marx claimed, um, which could easily happen in the face of, you know, exhausting, repetitive, soul-destroying work, um, women took these steps out of the factory, onto the streets and into the home, transmitted them and passed them on, and they were incorporated into the steps of the music hall. Um, we get an idea of the absolute overwhelming power of the machines that Marx was talking about, how, how they were like this um, uh, just, just overpowering um, noise and repetition. So here you see a very typical cotton mill um, with with just one type of machine. So in the piece that, that you might have looked at, which has shared the machinery, we only recorded one of each of six machines. There are about 600 here. So what we tried to do was convey a sense of this noise, um, which actually deafened most of the people working at the mill. But the fact that they could turn this into something creative I thought was quite astonishing. So how did clog dancing disappear? Um, this is a, a music sheet from about 1911 and you see uh, the happy mill girl with her happy mill partner um, doing a happy clog dance, very different to the idea of, of Marx and Engels of being subsumed by this horrible uh, labour that killed you by the age of about 35. Um, and um, the, the narrative that was created about the squalor and the misery um, of the working classes managed to wipe it out of people's consciousness and also wipe it out of the music halls. Um, the, the increasing licensing um, regulations that took over music halls and the requirement to, um, to constantly make themselves respectable meant that when I looked at which music halls had had their licenses taken away, most of them were associated with clog dancing. And um, it makes sense in that these were music halls that often attracted gangs, they often attracted quite a rough clientele, they were often in the worst parts of town, um, and they were the ones that the authorities had their eyes on. They were the ones that the police would have to be brought into, and they were often the ones that had lewd comic songs of the sort that Nelly Martel um, sang just before she did her clog dance. She, she sang about a sailor with a ginger knob. Uh, that gives you a kind of idea of the sort of quality of material that she performed. Um, by the early 20th century, the clog dance had become a kind of character dance. And we still see that in the um, in the dance uh, exams that children do today. Um, one of the exam dances is the Dutch dance. And here you see that they're wearing uh, a kind of heavy wooden clog. But if you look carefully, they're actually, um, they're actually over uh, the traditional type of working clog and, and they're tied on in a similar way. Um, so you still got the, the, the kind of ghost of, of the earlier clog dancing, but it's turned into something much more acceptable and, and much more um, um, pleasant, sentimental. Um, now, I did promise that I was going to mention orgasm. So just to end this talk, I'm going to talk about a, a really fine account of a female clog dancer um, and that's in Arnold Bennett's Clayhanger. And he describes Florence Simcox. Um, and he talks about how um, Edwin Clayhanger is absolutely transformed by the incredible dancing and by the autonomy 
and the independence that she um, displays in, in her championship clog dance. And it's a lovely account because it shows the way that a performer could absolutely um, hold a room in awe of, of this incredibly skilled and complex form of dance. Um, and, and Edwin's literally overcome with it. Um, he flushes hot and, you know, gets terribly excited. Um, but then it kind of qualifies this by saying that um, on the feet of, of Florence, everything that had become that had been squalid and bestial about the working classes had been transformed. So it really demonstrates this conflict that you constantly find in this form of entertainment between something that's appreciated um, by the lower classes and understood by the lower classes, but is constantly dismissed as being something squalid. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to end this because I don't want to go on too long. Um, but there's a link to um, the Machinery Project. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. That was really fascinating. Um, and yeah, no, no problem. Um, um, so yeah, uh, thanks uh, again, uh, both of you for those uh, papers. They're really interesting. Um, I do have some questions, but I'm going to go first to these ones that um, Jade has put in, in the chat. Um, the first one is for Caroline. Um, and it says, how can we talk in a constructive way about um, club dancing and hip hop dancing um, with its history of, uh, of the blackface tradition um, and with its connections to that? Um, so what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, it's, this is the area that I haven't explored because it was only towards, um, well, very recently realised, really, that I realised that there, there, there was such connection. Um, so I don't feel qualified, really, to be able to engage with it. I mean, obviously, you know, there's been masses written about the blackface um, performance and it's a pretty abhorrent, you know, dreadful type of appropriation that I think we can all agree on as, as being very misjudged in the 19th century. And clog dancing certainly wasn't um, any less uh, culpable in terms of appropriating that. But there, there is certainly evidence that there were black performers as well in the United States who, who would, were doing um, this type of dance and that British performers were inspired by it and that brought steps over and that they integrated them into the dance steps that we still see today. So I think, um, you know, I think there are two areas, one positive and one not so positive that can be explored um, from that point of view. But um, I think it would be very wrong to deny that there was a connection. And I think that connection is fascinating. And also in the machinery work, which I, I'm afraid doesn't have time to talk about, but we found that there were huge global connections um, in the industry and the fact that um, the cotton blockades had, had happened and that um, industry had been outsourced to India and we found similarities with Kathak dance. I did an amazing project with a South, um, a Southeast Asian company in Leeds uh, where we exchanged steps. Um, so I think this is, you, you know, really amazing area to explore. Um, thanks, thanks for that, Caroline. Um, and actually, that that question um, and your answer, I think, kind of leads into the next question um, that uh, uh, Jade's put for us, which is for Anna. Um, and it says, uh, "What do you think will need to happen to make uh, Shakespeare craft or Shakespeare craft inclusive?" I'm thinking in particular um, for um, queer um, and BIPOC people slash creators uh, of content. Um, so, it's a really great question, and I think. You can break it down into two steps. I guess the first question is how do you make craft um, kind of inclusive in that way? Um, that's a problem that Susan Luckman writes about because, as I mentioned, craft is marked by its kind of whiteness aesthetically. Um, so she talks about how it has this kind of um, high European 
um, aesthetic, um, which you can even see on that kind of emphasis. I mean, I'm giving myself away here, but you know, all the focus on these kind of woodland critters and that quite folksy aesthetic is very white, very European. Um, so it's about broadening that out. Um, there are definite efforts to do that. I mean, even um, for instance, there's a collective of Etsy makers in Leicester um, who have their own kind of accounts and they organize events. And certainly when there was the Black Lives Matters protest throughout the summer, they made a conscious effort to kind of advertise the black makers within the community on a regular basis. And I guess part of the drive to inclusivity is then really foregrounding these members of your community whose work may fit into that kind of aesthetic, may not, but who are probably kind of, um, I guess, a minority within that group. So you do need to make a more deliberate effort in order to advertise what they're doing so you can drive a more varied set of consumers towards their work. Um, in terms of how Shakespeare comes into all of this, I think he fits into craft because while there is an enormous market for Shakespeare and kind of literary inspired crafts, it's not so large or so kind of local that I think you could do something <clears throat> in the same way. Um, I think part of it is also kind of emphasizing those texts um, by Shakespeare that are more conducive to queerness potentially. Um, I think race is a really tricky issue with Shakespeare because I don't think you're going to find anything in Othello, for instance, that you would really want, you know, on a key ring. <laughs> um, but certainly there's a lot more to do with queerness um, and a really cool, um, I don't know if you'd call it a company, like an effort by an academic called um, Brett Hirsch is to make these kind of really cool editions and memorabilia to do with other Renaissance texts. And I think that effort to widen our awareness that it's not just Shakespeare. <laughs> he wasn't the only person writing in that century. That will also help because these kind of texts are inherently a lot kind of queerer or more inclusive or not even inclusive, just they show some weirder stuff than Shakespeare ever gets up to. Um, yeah, but a really great question. Thank you, Anna. And that just, it just made me think of something that you mentioned at the start of your talk and um, where you talked about um, how uh, cottage core in particular um, is 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 kind of looked towards as as a kind of space of reprieve by LGBTQ um, creators and consumers. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about that because I I am LGBTQ um, and I I have been more and more interested in this kind of aesthetic. Um, I I did actually laugh at the start of your presentation. I saw one of the um, screenshots was from Animal Crossing and the early months of the first lockdown were just completely consumed for me by that. <laughs> me I was too. just wondering if you could talk about um, more about that and, and what you've come across. Recently. Yeah um, it's an idea that Rowan Ellis talks about really nicely in a video essay that she does um, which is on YouTube. Um, you should be able to find it relatively easily. Um, she explains that for many people you know, if you grow up in kind of rural or semi-rural areas as a queer person, that space can often feel quite fraught, like it's not really your home or you might be kind of bullied or marginalised within it. So she explains that for, you know, queer people in particular, cottage court can be a way of returning to that space, which, you know, during your teens offered you no comfort or no solace. Um, certainly I remember you know, the village that I grew up in, it was surrounded by beautiful countryside, but, you know, as a lonely teen, I never wanted to spend much time in it. But now that kind of creative energy can take you back to it in a way that isn't fraught with your memories of, you know, when you might have been bullied or when you didn't want to go out by yourself because you're a teenager and you never want to go out by yourself. Um, so I guess it's this imaginative possibility of creating a landscape that is wholly for you and, you know, that protects you and nurtures you. Um, I love that. Uh, thank you. Um, I definitely will check that um, out on YouTube. Did you say it was Ro Rowan Ellis? Yeah, I'll find the link for you. Sweet, thank you. Um, and that sort of, um, that kind of made me think of something. I think, I can't remember who... <sighs> who said it but um in fact I think you both touched upon it in your talks the idea of that kind of creativity becoming a form of solidarity um and and 
an expression of power against more oppressive structures. Um, would uh, Caroline, you uh, you mentioned uh, some of that um, in terms of how um, people working in the factories took the dancing um, out out of uh, that environment and into their homes. And um, could you um, maybe just say a bit more about how um, that constituted a, a form of an expression of solidarity and um, community, that kind of thing? Um, well, I, th I think one of the things that we really asked questions about was why, when you had been working at a machine for 13 hours, would you then want to go and imitate it? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it is this total embodiment um, where, where you, you are literally, you know, becoming the machine, you're working at one with the machine. And if that's your life, um, you reflect your life in performance. Um, and so, um, you know, they, they, they passed it on. They passed on the steps between families and, and you know, within the community. Um, and then they were absorbed in, into wider dances. So you see elements of that particular dance popping up in lots of different dances. And it's not only the textile industry. I mean, the mining community had clog dances that were particular to them. Um, and I was handed down some of the minor steps. Um, and also the barge people, um, they imitated the sounds of the engine. So it was kind of identity and a creation of community. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to think how how sort of parallel things might have emerged in other uh, working communities. Um, well, I think there was little leisure time. And so work life balance wasn't a thing. It mm -hmm. was work 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 so your leisure reflected that work the, the, a lot of the competitions were competitions um geared around work practices so even in the music hall you you'd have people who made barrels making barrels on stage hmm. yeah that is that is really interesting um so i'm just i'm just trying to think um one of the things that I was um, going to ask um, was uh, you mentioned um, you, you, you talked about why we don't um, really see much said about um, clog dancing in the present. But then you also mentioned um, that there was some kind of resistance when you um, uh, were doing your research about um, the origins of clog dance. So I was just wondering um, what, if you could talk about more what what clog dancing is today and um, how popular it is and, and where in particular does it find favour? Yeah, well, there's been a real resurgence in clog dancing and, and that was, I mean, it started in the 60s and 70s when there was a folk revival because it basically disappeared in, in the kind of interwar years. You, you know, the First World War was just so just wiped out so many dancers um, and and, and, and then, you know, quite shortly after the Second World War. So it was only after that that people started collecting again and, and discovering dancers. And also the music halls had died out by that time. And so, so there were kind of two traditions. There was the music hall tradition when you get people like Sam Sherry who, who learned in the music hall. Um, and then and then you get this kind of family tradition that came more from the kind of, um, you know, the kind of workplace. Um, but now it's become, you know, it's very much part of the young folk mo movement. And there are some just incredible dancers who who are now carrying on that tradition of invention and originality and, you know, doing some absolutely wonderful shows that are, are mixtures of of different types of dance. Um, so somebody like the Demon Barbers will incorporate clog dance with break dance. And, you know, they, they're kind of postmodern, kind of mixing all these genres, which I think is where it needs to be. You know, it's developed in something new. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, think, I think it's really interesting um, uh, as well, what you were saying about um, your plans to go um, to America to develop these um, those histories, and hopefully that 
maybe that would be an opportunity to explore what um, you talked about um, earlier. Um, and just, uh, I just want, I've just got another question, um, just because I'm conscious of time. Um, I've got a question for Anna, um, which is just something that occurred to me. Um, I think it was towards the end of your talk, um, and you were talking about um, the various um, problematics of of the kinds of content that people were creating, um, whereby what, if it was erasing some kind of, um, if, if it was erasing the history of the message that was being appropriated into the craft. Um, and I was just wondering if you could um, talk about, about that a bit more, but also I was interested in if that um, is related to the kinds of objects or products that are being made. So. Um, things that are for display maybe versus things that people take around with them or wear, that kind of thing. Does that play into um, the kind of effect that it has? Mm. Um, just if you could, any thoughts you have on that um, and then we can maybe wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I must admit that's not something I've started looking at properly. Um, it's still a relatively recent project, um, but what I'd certainly like to do is to look at whether the form does affect the meaning um, I guess you see a real split in Shakespeare between items which quote Shakespeare in some way and those which seem to just represent him as a person. Um, and I think those that represent him as a person are doing their whole other kind of kettle of fish. In terms of quotations, I think, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've got me at the end of a very long day, so I'm a bit... Sorry, yeah, I just I wasn't sure myself if there would be an answer. I just was just thinking. It's really varied. Um, I guess the things I'm particularly drawn to are these moments when they seem to be trading on a kind of mainstream feminism in order to sell Shakespeare. And I'm not opposed to that in any means. I'm not kind of gatekeeping how you quote from Shakespeare because I'm an adaptation scholar. Like when I see that, I just go, yay, more work for me to do. Um, mm -hmm. But it is really striking that these are difficult texts to engage with or reappropriate as feminists because, you know, they're admired within misogynistic patriarchal structures. And very often the women within the plays themselves are given very limited agency. So it's not a kind of caution against using these plays in that way, but an awareness that I do think you have to be kind of cognizant of the context in which they're being adapted, which is a very deliberate act of decontextualizing. Mm. Yeah, that really um, it makes me think of, you mentioned Catherine Rottenberg in your paper who did a talk a couple of months ago on uh, neoliberal feminism and she mentioned the performativity of that, of constructing a neoliberal identity. So may maybe that there's something in, in that, I don't know. Yeah, um, yes, for sure. <laughs> um, that's more your area than mine, obviously. So, um, But yeah, I think, um, oh, we'll, we'll We've got we've got one more question from Jade, um, and then I guess we can um, wrap up um, if we have um, a quick sort of answer. Um, it's for Caroline. Um, it's uh, how does uh, clog dancing fit into idealized working class in the middle classes? So I guess that's the idea um, of a working class rather than the actuality. Yeah, I think that was summed up very quickly in the last two slides that I showed you, which was this idealised um, version of the Happy Mill Girl and, and lots of songs called things like The Clattering of the Clogs and, um, you know, this idea of, of the good old working class, you know, salt of the earth, um, which completely whitewashes all the misery and illness and desperation experienced by people in the factories. Um, and then, you know, it becomes something it, it, one step further removed in the Dutch dance. Um, and now, you know, I think folk music is pretty, if we're going to class it, yes, it's pretty middle class. It's not like a working class, you know. Um, so so it's, it's kind of carried on with, with that. I mean, most people who do clog dancing are professionals if you look at the kind of jobs they do and you know a lot of teachers a lot of um well all sorts of professions sweet um so i think um i think we're uh, rapidly running out of time so um, i will draw it to a close there um but thank you again so much um 
for your talks today and for your discussions in the Q&A.